David, um, I am very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Jessica Bidgen. Dr. Bidgen is a graduate of the University of Albany um, Department of Political Science where she got her PhD with a distinction. Um, she got the Distinguished Doctoral, Doctoral Dissertation Award. Um, she has a master's degree from UC Riverside and she is a graduate of Siena College. She is currently the federal liaison with the New York State Developmental Disabilities Planning Council. I first met Dr. Pigeon when she was a TA in my class. And lest you think that I was her mentor, she actually is the only thing that stood between um, me and total failure in teaching Introduction to American Politics. So I'm very <laughs> glad. <laughs> to, I'm very glad to see, and she pretends she didn't. Right? I'm very glad to introduce you to her today because she's going to talk about something that we don't spend a lot of time in many academic programs talking about, and that is a tra uh, transition to a non academic career, what uh, Jessica and I call pracademics. So, turning academic practice into non academic success. So I thought we'd start by talking a little bit about what it is she's doing now and how it is that in education, a graduate education, can get us to these kinds of positions and a little bit about why you chose to take this kind of position to begin with. So tell us a little bit about what it is that you do now. Great. Well, first of all, thank you for having me and inviting me to do this. Um, it's an honor to be here in front of, for, you know, have some of you behind me uh, today. So. Um, so my current position is I work for a New York State agency, uh, which is also federally funded. So I work with um, some federal agencies as well as state, other state agencies. The primary uh, role of my agency is to implement um, grants around the state that help support people with disabilities, specifically developmental disabilities, uh, and their families to live in the community and to thrive in the community. We do a lot of different cool pilot projects. So for example, one of the things we've done is train uh, first responders on how to better in, in, interact with, engage with people with developmental disabilities who might not, um, they might not have exposure to necessarily. So that, and it's part of my role in that agency. Um, I'm responsible for doing all of our federal reporting. Um, I help our grantees with evaluation and technical assistance, which is a fancy way of saying, you know, this is a question to add to your survey that will help you get at some outcomes of the work that you're doing um, and how to measure success of programs. Um, I also have um, done a bunch of trainings at the state and federal level, uh, lead meetings, um, work groups, and engage with a variety of stakeholders, uh, very diverse stakeholders in a lot of different so why would you choose a career like the one that you've chosen over a more traditional academic career? What is attractive about working for government? Um, so there are a variety of things that attracted me to working for the state rather than academia. One of them was um, <laughs> uh, one of them was at the time that I graduated was the academic market. Um, the other thing was kind of the stability of a nine to five job um, and to the place I was at in life, uh, you know, recently married and, and wanted to kind of settle down. Um, but the other thing which I think is um, more interesting than some of those, you know, adult things um, is really the opportunity to take some stuff that I'd researched and been interested in and, and you know, apply and apply it and actually do work in that field and to try to make a difference in a way that's not just through research and academic publication, but actually on the ground interactions and pushing out projects um, that specifically speak to uh, some of the research that I've done. So my dissertation was around um, the lack of participation of people with disabilities, political participation. One of the things that we've been able to do is I've been able to do some trainings of um, people with disabilities around their rights to, to voting. Um, we've also been in conversations with like the League of Women Voters and some other entities to increase participation of people with disabilities. So it's um, everything that I wrote about that I thought was important, and now I'm able to kind of try to address that in a practical way. Do you feel that at work? Do you go to work and you say like, I just did what I set out to do, you know, 15 years ago or 10 years ago or however long you were writing this dissertation ago? <laughs> it wasn't that, wasn't that long, thankfully. <laughs> 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 it was 
is long because I switched dissertations, but I don't recommend that. Um, <laughs> topics halfway through. But anyway, um, so actually originally I planned on going into academia. So it's not something that I had planned for the last 15, 10 years. Uh, while I was uh, writing my dissertation, I started interning for the state, and that's when I kind of shifted. Um, and since then, when I saw the ability to, one, kind of fill a gap in political science related to disability, because it's like the largest minority group that we don't talk about, even in political science. Um, so I found that I could do that research, and my job in the state could help inform my research and my teaching and influence on, you know, um, upcoming leaders in the field, right? Um, but also be able to do some of that tangible stuff. Um, so it wasn't always the plan. Um, but it feels nice to be able to do some of that yeah. um, and to really apply the research. It's not it's not my everyday. I have to do a lot of other things, too. So, <laughs> um, you know, when you work for the state, you do what they tell you sometimes, too. Um, but, but yeah, it's been fulfilling in that way. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, so what are the challenges? So if there's folks in this room and they say, like, oh, my gosh, I want to be just like Dr. Pigeon, what are some of the challenges or what are some of the key transitions that they might have to think about when they're moving from an academic kind of uh, background, you know, schooling, to a pracademic career. Yeah, so I think some of the things in my, and this is just from my own experience, um, but some of the things that I found challenging is um, when you're in the academic realm, you have a lot of ability to kind of just be on your own, doing your own thing, doing your own research, um, making decisions, you have a lot of control um, in some ways um, that when you shift to a non-academic position you lose some of that you know you go from being a sole entity or person that can do whatever you want um, in some ways to having to work in a team um, and having to um, think about and be conscientious of other people's ideas and their contributions as well another thing um, that I think is a challenge is um, for a lot of folks is that there's a lot of skills that you learn in an academic setting that you might not know translate to a non-academic setting in the way to frame those so that you can be um, like on your resume or in conversations to kind of sell yourself a little bit more. Um, so that's something I learned over time. Um, the interpersonal relationships that you have to have in a non-academic um, setting more so than an academic. Some of them are in this academic setting too, but that can be a struggle, so it's something to think about. Um, and one of the things, like a, a very specific thing um, for you, is that you know in academia we're really used to just reading something and kind of marking it all up and criticizing everything. That's the whole role of academia, right? Questioning everything. That's the thing that draws me to it. Like that's why half of you are probably here, and hopefully you'll use that to question me later, right? But so you just sit and you question everything. And that's like something I enjoy doing. But when you go into a non-academic field, you have to be very careful on how you start questioning things, <laughs> the way you present that. People aren't used to that always. In the academic field, people are very used to that, you know, so they don't take it personal necessarily. When you go into a non-academic field and you're like, did you think about this? What about this? You're marking stuff up with colorful pens and pencils. Um, it can be it, you know, people can feel different ways about that. <laughs> so you kind of have to, you know, you can still criticize and add um, your opinions and ideas and ask questions, but you have to do them in a, in a different way sometimes and be a little bit more strategic in how you frame it. Um, and also kind of come from a strength-based approach, um, which I'm sure some of you, hopefully if you're teaching, are doing that anyway. But that that's a big one, um, I think, that's important to know. Um, yeah, and not everybody will like think as fast as we do. Like we're kind of a couple steps ahead a lot of the times, right? <laughs> okay, so maybe this is just me, but we'll be in a meeting and people have great ideas or they'll be having a 30 minute conversation about like, you know, okay, how can we organize something? What are the big themes? And I've already written down in my paper 10 minutes ago, here are the big themes that everybody's talking about. And I'm just waiting for my time to be like, here you go, this is what we've all just talked about for 40 minutes, right? So um, so my mind moves a little bit quicker sometimes than other people, but sometimes you have to kind of take a step back um, and let people go through their own process like you would with your students um, as well. Can you talk about, so you said that 
that uh, folks here are getting skills, and I'm sure we're all happy to hear that. Um, Hopefully. What are, because we, we brought in someone from APSA to talk about transitioning to a non-academic career, what are those skills? What are the kinds of things that if I'm sitting in the audience, I can start marking down on my resume if I'm going into a non-academic career? So there are a number of them. I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, and there are a number of them that I would encourage you to think about. So how many of you uh, teach or have taught? Right, a good number of you. Um, so on your CVs, right, I'm hoping all of you have a CV, which is like an academic version of a resume. Um, in, in the non-academic field, it's resumes, so there's two different documents. But anyway, that's just a side point. Have both. Um, but most, in most people in the non-academic realm, they won't know what a CV is necessarily, just a side note. Um, but so all of your teaching, um, when you write it in your CV, you write it as teaching. Like these are all the courses I've taught. You kind of list it. Um, on your resume, you should talk about your facilitation skills, right? So one of the things that you do in a classroom is you facilitate conversations. And you facilitate those conversations. You keep people on track. You have a timeline in your class where you have to kind of get people from one class <coughs> to the next. You have um, certain goals for that day that you're trying to get through. Um, and that's you facilitating. The reason why I say to use it in a facilitation, like use that framing, is because when you go in the non-academic field, when you're in meetings or you're helping with conferences, you're facilitating those meetings. You're facilitating those conferences. I never realized I had really great facilitation skills, if I can say so myself. Um, <laughs> that's only because everybody's been telling me that a lot in the last few months, so it's kind of went to my head. But I never knew that, like I never thought of it that way necessarily. And then I'm like, well, yeah, I've been teaching for a really long time. Um, and that's what you do. That's what you do in the classroom. You facilitate conversations and you get things done and you kind of keep it moving. Um, another thing that you learn in academia is how to engage um, a variety of different, what we call stakeholders, but different groups, different people, different targets. Um, of a, you know, a range, so it might be students, it might be professionals at an academic conference, it might be professors, um, it might be your peers. So you have all of these different groups that you're engaging with, and you probably engage with them in different ways. Um, and that's what you do outside of academia as well. So you have that skill set, um, and you can kind of mark yourself as being able to have um, engage a variety of stakeholders being able to take complex ideas and share them depending on who your target population or group is that you're engaging with. Um, so it's really the, just the reframing of some of the words and some of the stuff you're doing to think about it outside of um, you know, how you might be thinking about it now. Then there's editing, writing skills, you know, some of these basic things that you're like, oh yeah, everybody has those. You know, not necessarily. That's something that you all have practiced at while you're in academia, because that's what you're doing often. Um, so your writing and editing skills, again, just you know, when you're doing the editing, um, do strength-based. <laughs> Don't do it like you would an article that you're reading for class necessarily, because <laughs> it'll get you in trouble sometimes. Um, and there's some others, but I think so, unless you want me to. Yeah, so you talked about what happens when you're teaching or what happens when you're writing. What about like you're a researcher? Like what, how do I translate the skills that I've been trained to use into these kinds of careers? Yeah, so I think like some of the, like a specific example, one of the things that I've been um, asked to do with you know the grantees that we support at my agency and also at the federal level is one of the big pushes in government is when they're pushing out money you know, measuring the outcomes, like what's the so what of the money that they're giving to somebody. And when you're looking at research and doing research, you're looking at all the different ways you can find out whether or not, like, uh, your questions, how to answer them. And you're looking at um, basically evaluating something, evaluating an idea. Um, and so that translates into the non-academic realm because you have experience making surveys and doing survey questions or doing interviews, whatever, you know, type of, research methods you're using on either side. So I've led, a no, I've led more focus groups in my state job than I did for any of my research. Um, I've helped my grantees and the federal level create um, better surveys or survey tools to be able to really gauge uh, the money that they're spending and the cost benefit of some of that and to be able to sell um, the work that they're doing. I help, um, some of my grantees are other universities, but they, they're not, um, necessarily PhD like they do work on the ground so I help them develop stuff um, more than I ever thought I would I also do surveys for 
uh, our agency when we're trying to get input. I've been basically the one in charge of fixing everybody's surveys. <laughs> or even just using the technology, like you know of technology that a lot of people don't know about. Um, my agency, we don't do a lot of uh, big research projects. We're kind of at the basic level, but a number of other agencies, some of the software that you use for like larger quantitative analysis are, are requirements for those positions. I just don't do that personally, but a number of them you do. Um, and then just finding literature and all of all of this, basically everything that you do can translate over um, to the non-academic realm. So what advice would you give to the folks here to develop those skills? Just go about your daily business or should they seek out particular opportunities? So one of the things, so I mean, as far as research goes, I think you should um, take advantage, obviously, of the classes that you're required to do, but also you know, attend national conferences or conferences around uh, evaluation or around uh, research if you can. Um, another thing that I've found invaluable, which might not seem as valuable um, at the like at the first thought of it, but um, I took advantage of a lot of opportunities to get involved outside of my department as well. So I was involved in um, the GSA. I was involved um, with sitting on some committees, uh, like uh, college-wide committees, um, I was involved, basically I had opportunities to meet a number of people outside of my own network, um, interdis interdisciplinary networks, and I ran into a number of them in my job working for the state in other ways, and being able to be like, oh hey, nice to see you again, let's have a conversation about you know something my agency wants to do, like let's collaborate or something like that. So take advantages of a lot of those opportunities that might not seem important now, but you never know, one, who you're gonna meet and where you'll see them again, um, and two, what skills might not seem important now, but later on if you shift or you decide to have like a shift, um, can matter in ways that you're not thinking about. You know, ITLAO, I took advantage of ITLAO a lot, um, which is, I don't know the, actually I actually only know the acronym, but teaching and learning, teaching learning stuff. Teaching. Um, that's the technical. Yeah, so how many of you have taken advantage of that resource? Oh my goodness, all of you should have your hands up. They do some amazing, at least when I was here, they did some amazing stuff. Um, so I would take advantage, it's, it's all free stuff. You know? It's free ways to get engaged and take advantage, or on your own campus if you have a comparable you know, office or experiences or opportunities. So you talked one about skills, but you also mentioned relationships, which is not something that we teach in graduate school, and not something we're particularly good at. You're not awkward at all. Staff, laughing, because they know what I'm talking about. So yeah. what are the kinds of interpersonal relationships? What, what, what do you mean by relationships? What do we need to be doing, and how can we make better at it? Yeah, so this is, not talked about a lot, but it's so important. It's so important to understand the dynamics of different people, the way different people express themselves, the way different people learn. Um, and just like if you're collaborating in any way or you're in a team, so how many of you um, maybe are co-publishing with somebody? A couple of you. That's fun, right? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's excruciating it depends right so but part of that is you might be working with somebody who has a completely different style than you have um, and when you're in a non-academic job unless you're running your own business by yourself you're engaging with other people with different styles all the time um, so some of the things that I've taken advantage of outside of um, you know when I was here is it, it wasn't as much a part of the experience I had here but you know like leadership trainings and um, understanding like emotional intelligence of that's a fancy way of saying you know how people think and react to stuff right um, so and there's tons of readings around about that, or maybe there might be stuff in other programs about it um, like psychology or social work I don't know but but it really matters for trying to like if you go into a room with people and you don't understand them and you, you think differently about something it can impact the end result it can impact how you feel how they feel the comfort levels you have working with each other um, so being able to engage a variety of people and to kind of meet them where they're at um, and see them from a different lens than you might have um, is really valuable for getting stuff done or for building relationships and another thing so one of the things that we've done at my job is we're trying to connect with commonly um, underserved communities so 
um, uh, communities that might not speak English as their first language or um, you know the Native American population where there's a lot of different like history behind it and different you have to know how to um, kind of meet people where they're at like you can't just go and be like hey we want to give you this money to do this without being like hey one do you want us to give you money and two what's the best way to go about doing that but unless you can engage people and understand where they're at and where they're coming from um, it can be difficult so I don't know if that really answers it but if you can have an opportunity to take advantage of leadership trainings of um, interpersonal trainings of like team collaboration and understanding different personalities of people on a team um, it's really important so I teaching the I taught the field seminar on public policy last night a bunch of you were there because you had to be but one of the things we always talk about is pracademics there's a lot of different careers that use public policy all the way from, hey, I'm going to be an academic who goes on Twitter and talks about things, all the way to I'm going to be fully engaged in kind of um, non-academic work, but I'm going to use my background. So it, it's a wide range, and I presented this range, and one year um, a student said, oh, that's nice, professor, but we're not doing any of that. We're only interested in the academic research. And then afterwards, one of the students came up to me and was like, oh no, we'll never say out loud that we don't want to be an academic because then the professors won't work with us and won't support us. So do you feel, this was very interesting information to me, do you feel that you got support here for the kind of pathway that you took or do you think we could be doing things better? Um, I would say that um, there were certain faculty that were, were supported I think a lot of faculty might not have um, experience with students who might not want to go in a non-academic realm because that's kind of the, the, the way that they went um, and that's what the department and faculty are used to. Um, there were some ways that you know I could have been more supported mm -hmm. than I was by the department. Um, so I do think, you know, and this is something that I think is so important right now because this, the skill set that you all have and the research that you're doing, it's because you're passionate about something and you're interested in that. And being able to take and apply those ideas in a tangible way and do something um, is so valuable. Like that's what you want at the end of the thing. But if you, you know, if the department doesn't support students to be able to do that um, and you kind of get pigeonholed to one track that maybe just doesn't end up being your track, um, then I think it does a detriment to the students and to, uh, to, to the field and into the department, I think that there's more that could be done by the department to support students that might want to take an alternative route than currently, or at least when I was here, um, is happening. And do you think students should do what they told me is not to like, hide their desires for what they really want, bury it deep down, or should they, I mean, there's legitimate reasons for doing that, or should they just be forthright with what they want to do? Um, so, I don't want to speak on behalf of all students. I think you should do what you're most comfortable with. Um, I think that there are a number of faculty in the department that would be supportive of you and would assist you and be able to connect you with the right people if that's something you're interested in. So don't completely shy away from it. Um, maybe kind of test folks out and then see. Um, but the other thing too is why it's important to maybe speak up more than you are is because if a lot of you feel that way, in the department, but the department doesn't know about it, then they can't help support you either. You know, so they might, or some people might have a certain perspective, or you think they have a certain perspective, but if you haven't actually all kind of been like, hey, by the way, there's a new shift here, like this isn't what academia is about anymore, or there's this other avenue, but they don't know that, then they can't improve to help you and to support you. So, um, so, I mean, I'm very outspoken as it is, so I don't know, you know, I'd be like, yes, everybody, you know, go to the, you know. <laughs> but yeah, but I think, I think it's important though, like if there are a number of people that feel that way, um, then you know, you're a number, like, people can't support you if they don't know. Um, and there are some faculty that are supportive, Kathy being one of them, not to throw you, you know, but, yeah. <laughs> So can we talk about your research for a second? Sure. So you wrote a dissertation on disability politics, and in the introduction you say the gap is substantial enough um, in voting 
In the 2000 election, it's estimated that over 20 million individuals with disabilities did not vote. In comparison with other groups, the, those with disabilities were the largest demographic group of non-voters. So that's a lot of people not voting. And if we think back to the most recent presidential election, for example, if 20% of those voters had participated in the election, we would have seen a more definitive election result one way or the other. So um, do you think the situation for individuals with disabilities has improved or changed in the last two decades? Um, so in, so when it comes to political partici participation specifically, um, I think in some ways there's been improvement in attention given to types of political participation. So um, for example, I don't know how many of you know that recently healthcare was under attack, right? Probably yeah. most of you, yeah, it was all over the news, right? Yeah, I'm not surprised. So, um, but with that, there were a lot of protests by individuals with disabilities that made it to the media. People with disabilities have been protesting for decades, you know, but it's not always covered. Like the civil rights movement, you're all probably pretty aware of, the women's rights movement. But how many of you have read anything about the disability movement? One, you don't count because you took my class. <laughs> Two, <laughs> you count, I'm just kidding. You know, I love you. Uh, so a few of you, right? And I'm surprised that even, you know, that many people raise their hand. It's just not something that's taught. There's not a lot of research about it. Um, but they have been, the, the, the group, you know, has been active for decades um, with strong protests. Um, so that happened and that got a little bit more media coverage recently than it has in the past. So I think in that way there's a little bit more attention to it. Um, there's also more members of Congress, which Dr. Friedman's here, who's done some research around this, I've seen um, just over there, more members of Congress that um, you know have a disability, so that kind of helps too. But when it comes to voting, there's still a lot of barriers that people with disabilities face. Those are physical barriers to a polling location. Those are barriers to the um, the devices that we're casting our ballots on, um, especially in New York State. Um, and then also there's you know, these social barriers um, that are beyond the physical piece of it. But you know, poll workers having a lack of comfort comfortability or attention or um, ability to engage with people with disabilities or to serve them um, in the way that they serve others. Um, there's stigma around whether or not somebody with a disability should be participating. So some people have physical disabilities, um, some people have intellectual disabilities. So whether or not people with an intellectual disability should be able to uh, participate in politics or vote is a question that um, some people might have, although I would argue most of the general public, like public doesn't have a level of political knowledge <laughs> that we might uh, require of somebody or hope of somebody with a disability would have. Um, but that's a, a side point. Um, but so in that way, you know, there's still a huge uh, gap in participation, specifically voting of people with disabilities um, that's happening even with you know, a number of different pieces of legislation to support um, voting. And then we've seen, obviously, we've seen a recent attack on other forms, like any other people who are trying to participate, which also impact people with disabilities, so like voter ID things or closing of polls, like some of that stuff we've seen in different state levels that doubly impacts a person with a disability, usually. You know, what, where's the policy development happening? So we see stuff going on on the national level. So first of all, what is it like in New York? and where do we see positive movement in terms of what's being done? Is it at the state level, is it at the local level, maybe national level, or what, what's the yeah. situation here? And then where do we see good things happening and where do we see not so good things happening? Um, wow, that's a big question. So, uh, there's a lot happening um, in, in disability politics and policy at all levels of government. Um, in the state of New York, we're going through a huge transition in disability policy related to how we kind of pay for services and um, it gets really complicated quickly so I don't have time for that but um, they're trying to shift it in a way in which most people think would be more positive and more individual based um, but with a huge change in a system like so think about us changing how we implement social security which has been in place for decades it's kind of similar to that like New York has been operating in a certain way for decades and people are used to that and now over a very short amount of time, we're transitioning everybody and people are very scared and nervous and there's a lack of information. So um, the end result could be good 
but we're not sure yet. Um, when it comes to things like employment, there's been a huge push around employing people with disabilities. There's also a huge gap in employment of people with disabilities, similar to voting. Um, there's issues around education. Education is probably one of the areas where there's been the most positive um, policy stuff happening, um, although there's still some issues. Um, basically, there's issues in every policy area because the, the group that we're talking about um, is not as politically active. They're invisible in a lot of ways. If you don't have a personal connection to them, you probably aren't even thinking about it. Um, or haven't thought about it until you walked into this room and now hopefully you think about it every time you think of anything <laughs> moving forward that's part of my job um but so at the, at the state level there's been some positive traction but you know there's not the level of attention that you see for other minority rights um and, and in a weird way there's also this you know there's different minority groups and most of them won't incorporate disability into the conversations for their rights. It's like very siloed. And it's siloed specifically. This happened in the civil rights movement as well, where you know disability movement was happening at the same time and they tried to kind of you know join together and the civil rights movement was like, we got enough of our own problems, we can't be pulling that into it too. Um, so that impacts um, you know what's happening. At the national level, under the current administration, um, policy is moving backwards in some ways for people with disabilities. Um, so they're reopening a lot of legis or a lot of um, policy legislation um, that's been passed to support people with disabilities living independently and working. Um, they're reopening and reevaluating and kind of taking it a few steps backwards from where you know they currently are or have been uh, recently. So it's not. I can't say it's pretty, no. In most ways it's not. Like, how many of you are interested in social um, justice or juvenile justice or <coughs> right, immigration or all these policy areas? So take that and the struggles that you see for those populations and then add somebody, you know, thinking of intersectionality, add a disability onto that. So even some of the recent immigration proposals impact people with disabilities. Um, juvenile justice, one of the most uh, underreported or unacknowledged group of people who are being pushed into that system are students with disabilities, especially students with disabilities from minority populations that haven't been identified as a student with a disability but has behaviors that put them into that pipeline. Um, so it's not pretty in some ways, but in other ways, you know, the employment rates have increased a little bit. Um, um, there are more students with disabilities that are trying to access college education. Um, whether or not colleges are prepared for that is a different story, but so it's not all doom and gloom, but there's a lot of work that's needed and more advocates needed to kind of push um, for people with disabilities or think about when you're thinking of all these other policies. One of the one of the fun things about being an advisor of a pre-academic is you spend a lot of time with that person, you read their dissertation through and through, and then they go off <coughs> into the real world and one day you open up the newspaper and you see their dissertation topic and they've just done something about it. They've just passed a policy or made a new initiative. Okay, but most of the time that doesn't happen because we don't get that kind of like, here's the Times Union focusing on whatever my student just did. Yeah. So can you tell us about like in what ways your dissertation has helped you in your work? So not just the skills, but the specific knowledge that you learn from it? Yeah, so, you know, some of the things, so my dissertation talks a lot about part the participation of people with disabilities with voting, but also other forms. But another interesting part of it, which I haven't mentioned, is it also looks at the role of family members and support staff around people with disabilities and how they think or view um, people with disabilities, and what, including their own family members, and whether or not they should be engaged, like I touched on a little bit. So um, I did a survey, and you know, there's not a lot of literature, unfortunately, so that's one of the contributions of my research is the fact that nobody's, not many people are talking about disability in political science, but um, the other thing is by doing a survey and getting some of that um, information um, through my dissertation, now when I'm engaging people around increasing participation of people with disabilities, including family members or support staff, I know some of the ranges of opinions they have on the matter. Um, so I can take what I learned from my surveys and be like, okay, so I know that there's this mixed feeling about whether or not 
somebody feels as though their child or sibling with a disability should be participating. So I know that there needs to be an education or training for people who support people with disabilities um, in order to make movement on this. Um, so some of those things where you kind of really learn the content and information, um, or if you guys are doing stuff with you know, any policy area, immigration, social justice, then you know some of the context. You also know like the politics side of it, right? So not everybody is thinking about stuff through the lens of politics and what that means. But that is so important, um, even in non-academic jobs. Like it's really important to know like, okay, here's some of the history, here's some of the politics about why stuff has or hasn't happened in policies. You know, here's how we're defining this problem under a certain administration and what that means for how we solve the problem. Um, so you have some of that context and background so that if you want to go and make change, you're like, okay, so I understand these pieces and I know that, you know, here's the way to define it, here's a way not to define it, or here's how I can get to this result, or here are some people that might be on board, here are some people that might need a little bit more education around it. Um, yeah. So if you understand the pieces, right, what are the challenges that prevent um, more or better progress? For people with disabilities? Yes. Oh my goodness. Decades of, um, <laughs> like before I was, well before I was born, um, decades of social stigma around people with disability, a lack of understanding, the fact that um, people with disabilities are invisible in a lot of ways. Um, whether or not some, and there's, and also with disability, there's a range. Like, I'm talking about it like it's, you know, one cohesive group. That's not the case. That's just a simplification of it. Um, but there's a range of people with disabilities. Some people are like, yes, I have a disability. I'm going to advocate. Some people, you know, don't want to acknowledge a disability. Um, the people around people with disabilities who you, you might think would be like, yes, like let's support um, to make some support to change, which in a lot of ways family groups and others have been the reason some policy has happened, but um, in some ways they hold people back. So there's, there's a lot of dynamics um, to this policy area that can really impact progress mm -hmm. and change. And the other thing is um, the way that politicians, not all, but a number of them think about people with disabilities also impacts change. So it's commonly, you know, they're commonly referred to as a vulnerable population. So if that's when you're going into it, you're like, oh, this is a vulnerable population. Let me think about what needs to be done or not done. Um, you're, you're approaching it in a very specific way. So it's hard to make progress to get people participating or um, to get people employed if you're like, oh, well, half of these people are really vulnerable. Somebody will take advantage of them. They can't live in the community by themselves if that's the framing that you have. So there's, you know, like, there's so, <laughs> there's so much there. Um, and then you have, like, you know, different, as, as political leaders shift, um, all of that impacts it, too, like the politics behind it. Um, so it's really complicated, like all policy. Um, but the other thing, too, is there's not enough people speaking up that are not connected to that group or that movement, right? So even with, like, the civil rights movement, some of the success around that movement was outsiders helping and supporting that movement along. Um, there's not as much of that, like usually the people that are part of the disability movement are somebody with a disability, a family member of somebody with a disability, even like politicians, if you're a family member of somebody with a disability, then you'll push for something, but that's not the majority. Um, so there's not enough people like you who are one, aware of it, or two, helping advocate or bringing that perspective um, to the table. Um, so just a lack of education awareness of others to the population. Um, that's how larger shifts happen is when you have a number of people outside of the community as well as the community on board cohesively pushing for something. Um, and I feel like that hasn't happened as much in the disability movement as other movements that have had a little bit more success. So if these folks here are so motivated by this discussion that, yes. they, want <laughs> that they want to do something about disability politics, what should they do? What can the average person do? So much you could do so much um, so one like I said is you know when you're thinking of all of these areas that you're interested in think about disability too when you're publishing or you're thinking about minority groups don't forget that group just putting it out there there's there's very limited um, research around disability like you know it's it's 
it's kind of sad to be honest right so that's it's just limited so start adding that into your stuff in those little ways if you want to do something like more tangible then um, you can work in the field you can um, you know there's one of the things I've given a number of my students the opportunity to do is every election there's a local um, entity that goes around and has people assess poll sites um, did you do no um, so a number of my students have done this over the last few election cycles. They find it enlightening, like it opens up their eyes to things. So you get taught in a very short training how to look at a poll site and see whether or not it's physically accessible. Um, and you go to a few different poll sites and then you take that information, you share it back with them and they pull together a whole report. Um, and then they can engage different counties and boards of elections and say, you know, this isn't right, like this isn't accessible or X, Y, Z. Um, and in some cases, the data and research that my students have contributed have led to them being able to file lawsuits against some of the counties to get change. Um, so that's another thing that um, you know I would encourage you if you're interested in doing. All of my students who have done it have enjoyed it. Um, and then they come back and they're like, I've also th seen things on campus now. Like everywhere I go, I'm seeing through this lens and that's what I love to hear. Um, the other thing, which I don't, you know, I've taught a disability class for the school. I don't know if I'll be teaching it in the future, but if I am, take my class, because then you'll be thinking about it even more. I have a number of students who are working down at the Senate and Assembly now, or interning down there, um, that are able to engage and support uh, the members that they work for to think about disability um, in, in, a right, in the right way. How did you get involved in this kind of research, and why would you switch halfway through Ugh. and prolong the process? The process. <laughs> Yeah, so my original dissertation topic was also really cool, if I can just say so myself. So I was looking at entertainment politics and Saturday Night Live um, impersonations of presidents and then connecting it to political knowledge. And you are so ahead of your time. <laughs> right? right? Um, so now it's like a whole thing. Like if I was doing it now, that'd be so much cooler. But, um, and then I started, so one of the reasons that I kind of switched over is I started interning at the agency that I'm currently at. So. As a graduate student, I don't know how many of you know this, but um, you know that you, you need money, right, to live. I don't know if any of you felt feel this way. I did, right? I heard it, right? So I needed financial resources to survive, um, right? So I started interning for the state because they pay well. State interns pay pretty well. You get benefits, you get in the system, you know, all that adult stuff I was talking about. Um, and started working at this agency. Before that, I had no exposure to disability myself. I was also one of the, you know, people that was like, this is invisible. You know, I didn't even realize. I had never thought of this in the millions of years I've been a political science student. Um, so I started interning for financial reasons and then quickly was like, oh, wait a second. You know, and started thinking about like, I've been studying participation in media um, for years now in political science and I have never once read an article about disability. Never, and I was it. And at that point, I'd been in school. Um, I've always been a political science student, with the exception of like freshman year of undergrad. Um, and, right? <laughs> I was gonna be psychology, and I was gonna be a lawyer. And now, you know, I don't know. Who knows what I'll be next year? But anyway, um, <laughs> but yeah. So then I started interning. I was like, this is this is missing, like, completely missing from the field in a lot of ways. Um, and so what I did is I was still working on my other dissertation, which was going very slowly. Because it was interesting, but I just wasn't, um, you know, fully fulfilled with that. And then I came and I, I was like, I really want to do some research around this on the side. So then that kind of took over my attention. I presented at a conference like this, the, the same one, but it was years ago now, one of the first few that they did. Um, my researcher, like my preliminary research around voting people with disabilities, and I was like, yeah, yeah, I need to do this. Like this is what I should be doing. And then I had to figure out um, how to approach my chair and be like, hey. By the way, I have this crazy idea. I should change my dissertation, even though I've been working on this other one for like a year and a half, two years. Um, and then I changed it, and she was on board, which is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, very, very thoughtful. I had to change some committee members. Um, and then I went with it, and it, I finished that one much quicker than the first one I started um, because there was just such a need for it. That's a great lesson that the easy dissertation is never easy because if you don't care about it, it's impossible to get moving. Yeah. I wanted to, to leave time for some questions. I mean, I could talk forever, but that <laughs> will be fun for you or for Dr. Pigeon. Are there questions? Yes, ma'am. So I'm um, a hiring manager of faculty and also professional staff, and I've sat on 
committees for nursing staff and faculty, and I hope my next job is in corporate, and I, I like management, and I like, I want to run a bigger team. Um, and you just mentioned internships. Um, and I know that we can all work our resumes to make everything that we've done in school and our research and our teaching uh, relevant. Mm -hmm. um, but in this in this era, that hands-on work-based learning, you can do it. You can show you can do it. You have professional references. What would you recommend for someone? I mean, how how common is interning at the school? What other things could you recommend for someone, especially? when I see people who are, and this is no disrespect to anybody, but somebody who's maybe 26 with a PhD and never had any um, professional experience. Yeah, so, and that's one of the things I had on my card, but I didn't say, but if, you know, in political, in the political science side of Rockefeller, at least when I was here, I can't speak for now, um, we didn't talk about internships much for the PhD for political science. Um, public admin, it was talked about more because that's kind of like, it's assumed that that's the track you'll go into the field. Um, I did it for financial reasons, um, and you know, it was probably one of the best things that I did at that time, because you're right, like having experience um, is helpful. And so if, if there's any part of you, and don't tell your chairs I said this, but, or although it's on camera, but um, <laughs> if there's any part of you that's just like, you know, I don't know, or I'm not sure, or if the department can consider um, ways or opportunities for folks in the political science side to also take advantage of internships. It's really important that you do that because, like you said, you have the teaching experience and all of that. But if you don't have some of the other background on your resume that says, like, hey, you know, I've also I've worked for a state agency or I've worked for a federal agency or what have you, um, then it will be a little hard to get into that realm because, um, you know, some state agencies and some, uh, you know, staff of state agencies. I've had, um, they don't always have great experiences with PhDs who come in um, because you're coming in from a, 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 you know, a specific mindset like, I'm doing this to help with my research. Um, and you know, that's not always looked upon fondly because that's not, like they want you there to help them. Um, and so having the opportunity to build some of those skills to make some of those connections um, with people I think is, is an important part of um, succeeding or being on the way to success. Um, there's other ways if you can't do an internship, but you can kind of connect with people through networking or other events um, and do that as well. Because not everybody I know will be able to do an internship if you're also teaching and TAing and those things. I get it. Um, but especially like later on when you're doing your uh, dissertation, when you might be a little bit out of that, which don't not do your dissertation. I'm not saying, you know, take longer to do that. I won't say that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But um, that might be, like, that's when I kind of shifted and did an internship with the state and kind of extended my um, experience and opportunities. I don't know if that answers your question, yeah, no, but I, I think just, it's really important, and I think that's a great, uh, a great point that you're bringing up. Just the other note is, especially when I see people who've gone high school, undergrad, graduate school, I mean, people literally have never had a working day, you know what I mean? Like a banker's hours working day. Yeah. So that's... That can be a huge adjustment when you get up whatever time. Yeah, it can be. And I mean, I can't speak. I've been working since I was 15, so I can't, I don't have yeah. that experience. But um, but it can, But I am the coordinator of the internship at my agency. Like, I supervise the interns, and I just got that job. Um, and I bring people in, so I look at resumes and stuff. And, um, you know, it can matter. The, I mean, the other thing that would be important, too, though, is, um, well, one, you know, shaping your resume in the right way, like I was saying before, how you frame it, that can be the difference between you getting in the door, even if you have no experience. Um, and two, uh, in the interview, like be, be prepared to, you know, have questions that you might not use, be used to having, which actually Rockefeller does a really good job. They have like a whole handbook and everything. I've, I've been employed for a long time now in the state and I still look at that <laughs> handbook. Like the whole, is it star or something like that, where you take, you know, like you, you have a skill and then you you give a scenario where, you, where you've applied it, like it's the best thing ever. I did like a mock interview with another agency and then they tried to steal me from my agency. Like, it's magic gold. Um, so do that in your interviews, do that. Do what they give you, it works. I don't know, if, what is it, is it called STAR? Or? I think it's our, we have a career handbook and we do talk about internships at PhD orientation now, so. 
That's great. And I do think, like, as an advice, I don't think it's a bad thing at all. I think it's a great thing if you're going to be a strict academic and you go out and you go to the local health agency or wherever yeah, you go. And, you know, even if you're the most, you know, I'm going to sit behind a computer for the rest of my life and talk to myself, you know what, I do, I do that actually, I, you know what variables to put in your model because you know what's actually happening and it gives you some sense, it gives you some external validity to your research. So it's not That's a true. It's never a bad thing, even if you're going to be a traditional, you know, academic. Yeah, I think that's that's very right. Yeah, because one of the things you know you hear a lot in the non-academic is like what they teach you in classes is not yeah. how it's happening yeah. here. Um, so in that in that vein, um, it's definitely yeah, kind of getting to know folks. Because we can do better research too. Mm -hmm. Good questions. Yes. In terms of like voting policies that be most beneficial for. Um, you know, if you really care about you know getting more people with disabilities voting, um, what sorts of policies would be the best ones to support? Like, is it absentee voting? Um, is there other things that you know you could maybe support locally or the state level? Yeah. So, one thing I think is um, the actual enforcement of the Americans with Disabilities Act as far as physical accessibility. I think that's important. So, there's policies out there that just aren't enforced. Um, so, instead of creating something new, like you know, better enforcement and knowledge and awareness around those. Um, the other thing is um, policies that would um, basically further the training or education of poll workers to be able to engage with people with disabilities. Um, some people with disabilities might want to take advantage of uh, mail-in voting or absentee. Um, I'm very cautious with that being a recommendation that I have because just personal perspective, I don't think people should be relegated to something like that. If they want to be at the polls and participate in their civic duty like everybody else, then they should have that opportunity. Um, but for some folks, something like that might be um, better for, for you all to push. Um, yeah, there's not, there's, the other thing too, which is an interesting variable um, that some other research around this is, is um, the more people with disabilities that are engaged in their community or working or some of those other non-political participation things, the higher the, the rates of their participation. So all of these other policies that support that, like in community involvement and awareness um, and employment, could then also impact participation rates. So support everything. That's not helpful, I know. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. are you cool? <laughs> um, I'm thinking about sort of the reverse academic perspective of, you know, so if you're an academic but you want to kind of work with practitioners, um, and, and um, I'm actually thinking about this right now from a very specific example where I, um, you know, a lot of times funders now want to show, you, want you to show in your proposal the policy impact, like the real world policy impact and whatever you're mm -hmm. studying is going to have. And I actually just got off a call with um, my uh, collaborator who was the PI on this Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant that we found out did not get funded because they wanted like concrete examples of like these are the people you're going to go talk to in government yeah. and you know show how these results are going to be impactful and influence policy that way. I'm wondering from your experience, I mean so I think probably definitely something like you would be open to maybe talking to, to academics but like yeah. what is your experience with other people in state agencies and how they how willing they would be to with academics, um, or I mean, is that something that's even reasonable for a funder to think that you know you could just to call up your you know local policy person who works on X and you know tell them your results and that that's you know, what would be the right way to go about something like that? Um, so I'm not surprised. Is it is it a is it was it a grant opportunity? Was it a foundation you said or a Dr. government Johnson. grant? Foundation. Um. So there's a lot of grants out there for this kind of like pra practical um, research kind of. Um, I mean, that's what we do, like my agency, we do stuff where we want stuff to be evaluated and we want to see outcomes or those connections. Um, but there's also, um, you know, this, like you're actually doing something, you're changing something. Um, so that doesn't surprise me. Uh, there's a lot of grants in those kind of ways from the federal, state, local level. Um, I mean, I think it depends on who who you're trying to engage. Like, you can reach out to, you know, state workers or state agencies or uh, legislators, um, and you'll probably 
depending on what you're you're asking about, which I don't know and how sensitive it is politically, um, you would probably get responses to it. You would probably be meeting with uh, lower level staff of either of those branches of government in the beginning, I would expect. Um, but that's not to say you couldn't get what you wanted. Um, but I don't know without kind of knowing you know, like more specifics of what you're trying to do. Like I think, and it also depends, so some, um, like if we're talking about legislators, some are way more approachable or able, you can get access than others. Um, when it comes to um, like the executive branch and state agencies, which is where I'm housed is under one of those, um, it would depend on the topic area, how controversial it is, um, how the um, leadership of the state feels about that and access to it in some ways. So. Yeah, I don't know if that was helpful at all. Um, but I can see why a funder would want that because that kind of shows, like you're saying, the like impact of your research. So that's one of the things that um, I think is a, is something that would be valuable for um, the department to think about. I think that the way that government is shifting and some of their priorities from what I've seen in my field is, um, you know, this, it, it would be, kind of like a relationship between academic and you know, practical stuff um, more often than we've thought about. Like in the past as academics, we'd write for each other. We do research for each other. Um, and then the field's doing this, but they're not evaluating anything like an academic would do. In, in most of what I've seen and heard at the national level is there's this real push right now for evaluation, outcome-based, value-based stuff across all policy areas. So that marriage of the two um, is important and increasingly become important. So the more that you all think about that or the department can do to support that, the better you would be. Um, and Patty does some of this. Yeah. So, so that, she would be a good person to chat with too. Uh, you know, like the um, NIH. <laughs> Not to pass it off, but. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> See how good she is? So the NIH, um, I've heard, is not funding black box studies anymore. So you can no longer just show there's a relationship. So you do an intervention, you find out it works. They, that's not good enough anymore. They want to know what is it about the intervention that works. So how can we replicate this in other kinds of contexts? Robert Wood Johnson wants this connection. So I think you know the, the best way to get folks on board with your research is talk to them before you do anything. And are you asking the right question? If they think you're asking a stupid question, they don't want to hear your results when you're done, right? Right? You're asking a question that's formed because you sit in a in an office behind a computer and you have no sense of reality. So if you go there, you talk to them, I want to learn about what's important, what are the key questions. If you're asking the question that they want answered, then they're going to be very likely to help you and to listen to you. Um, as long as it doesn't require any of their resources. Right. But if you're saying, like, I'll get the grant, I'll do the work. I need to know, is this a good question? They'll say, you know, no, you should be asking this. Or this is who you should be talking to. Basically, what's in it for them? Yep. Are there any other questions before we wrap up? All right, before we give Jessica a round of applause, I wanted to just say, do you have any closing advice to, to the graduate students or anyone in this room about um, pursuing an academic career? I mean, I think I've said a lot of stuff throughout. Um, I think, you know, like I said, some of the highlights would be taking advantage of a multitude of opportunities that you have. Um, getting experience on the ground, even in your research field, if you have that opportunity. Um, networking outside of your own departments and group, because, you know, I ran into people that I knew from the GSA. I've ran into a number of people that have helped me further stuff that I want to do. Um, and then working on uh, the interpersonal leadership, managing styles. Um, if you have the chance, it's really important. We are going to have a chance to do all of those things at lunch where we get to talk <laughs> to one another and get network cards. and practice our interpersonal <laughs> skills. And I want to give Jessica a big round of applause for Thank <laughs> you.